and started in 2015. So I might have overlapped with a few of you, not sure, probably not at this point. I'm getting old, but uh, Cole's also an envoy with me too, and a UND graduate as well. I'll let hey y'all, I'm Cole. Um, I started in the fall of 2016, graduated May of 2019, and then started um, envoy the fall of 2019. So been about two years since I've been going. We'll give a little bit of background on just what we wanted to talk to you guys um, today. We have a few slides, things that we thought would be very helpful for you guys to know after being exactly in your shoes at UND. So talking a little bit about social media, how it can help other people, also some do's and don'ts, like how social media that you guys can use in school can be a big benefit to your career, but it can also sort of like impede your progress a little bit if you do it wrong. Um, so we wanna talk about that. Uh, training habits, which Cole knows being a CFI better than myself, um, going through and just seeing what you guys can be doing even from 102 all the way through your flight training to make your transition just a little bit easier into the airline world. Um, what it's like for us flying on the way and then the three cues, which is a big, big point that we will explain at the end. But first, I guess I'll start off with myself. So um, I went to a high school in Richmond, Virginia. That's where I'm from. That's where I did my flight training when I was super young. Uh, at like 15, 16 years old before I came up here to UND. Flew for a small airline in Hawaii called Mokalele that was a part 135 carrier in the islands flying caravans to build most of my flight time, which was an awesome experience. Um, and that's kind of how I got up to my thousand hours uh, for the restricted ACP to get to Envoy right after graduation. That's like a spark note for me and then Cole. <laughs> Okay, so my story, I grew up in Waco, Texas, so part of Texas, um, went to school there, did my uh, private license down there, came up to UND, did the 112, and um, all the way through double I instructed here for about six months, then I left and I went to a Part 61 school back in North Texas in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and then um, over to Envoy in the fall of 2019, and now here we are today. All right, so social media. Um, you guys all probably love using social media, sharing it um, online, sharing your flight experiences. There are a few things that we saw, so we turn my phone off, um, and learned over time that I've seen uh, become detrimental for people's career. Um, I've seen people that I went to school with at UND who got in trouble for posting you know, their flight uh, training with students on board during like critical phases of flight, and those stories have carried with them all the way into airlines, and it's become an issue for them. But there's also really good things that can be done with social media. And I'm sure some of you guys have seen this, um, but I do produce a series of videos that's dedicated to help people understand the difference between being a student pilot and a CFI and then moving on to be an airline pilot. All of us here have spent upwards of $100,000, right, to get your professional uh, degree and ratings to become an airline pilot or a professional pilot. The whole thing, though, is that sometimes schools don't do a great job helping you transition directly into some of the things that you need to know for your career. So that's kind of some of the stuff that I do, um, and especially with airlines. Social media can mix, but carefully. And Cole, does Envoy technically allow us to be able to take pictures at all at work? Technically, no, but you know, you do it with um, some caution and you know, promoting a good image of yourself, your school, your airline works out pretty well. Yeah, generally speaking, the airline, it, they won't come after you even if it's a policy, um, if it's something that you're posting personally and showing with friends and family. Um, but the second that you're doing something that could be perceived as unsafe, that could be a bad view for the airline, even if it's not related to work, um, I've seen people get in trouble for that before. So definitely just be careful even at this stage of where you are. Um, I guess for what I do, at least in my world, um, kind of a little bit removed from what Cole's doing, but the filming that I do, for instance, I have to film everything when I'm filming in the flight deck at Envoy under part 91 with no passengers on board and a handheld camera from the jump seat, which is actually what I was doing yesterday. Very restrictive, that's not a regulation, that's not a federal rule that's been written anywhere except our FAA POI, which is the inspector for the airline, asked that those were the rules that we follow. So sure, go for it, you know, that's just the rules that we have to go with to make it happen. Um, the 360 degree stuff, there's going to be more of this coming um, that I was filming yesterday. I thought that this would be a really cool thing for you guys to be able to like get into the cockpit, be able to turn your camera around in YouTube and actually watch a flight unfold, see the pace at which people are running checklists and doing flows, to see how crew interaction works, all of that stuff. 
Um, so I'm planning on doing more of that in the future. Um, and the one that we do have up there right now uh, was with a good friend of mine named Phil, and it has like 7 million views because I think it's pretty much the only video that anybody has been able to film in that way with the airlines. Cole, I'll let you kind of lead off with the training stuff for UND. All right, so training habits. Um, obviously, we're all up here to um, get to our end goal, whether it be airline pilot, cargo, a um, bush pilot, whatever it may be. Um, you devoted your time uh, in high school to be able to get chosen to be at UND and to get to your future job. That's why we're all here. So, um, of course, college is a time to have a uh, you know great time, so work hard, play hard. Um, while I was here, I was a student athlete on the golf team for about a year before I um, started to be a CFI. So, talking about training habits, um, being on the golf team, I'd be gone for about six days at a time. Um, you know, if you have two, three flight labs a week, um, you know, all your five other classes, it piles up. So, really gave me a um, smack in the face to, you know, priority, prioritize my job. You learn a calendar, right? Yes. Because all of a sudden when you become an airline pilot, like your life is no longer just classes. You guys kind of have calendars, right? But it becomes even more intense when you're an airline pilot. Your entire life is dictated by that calendar. When you're working and when you're not working, um, that flight schedule is a big, big deal. You really have to like plan, okay, I'm gonna go to the grocery store this day so that all my food is gone before I leave on my trip or you know your social calendar with your friends your family and all that kind of stuff you really have to um you know prepare and plan for all that stuff one thing that we wanted to talk and kind of lead off with um in terms of training habits we're talking about things that you guys can do really early on um is checklist usage right UND does a really good job teaching people flows and the call response checklist that you do at the airlines um keep in mind if you're a student maybe not for the cfis out there you might do 10 checklists during a flight, and it can feel cumbersome at times, especially when your before landing checklist is like three items that you know by memory, right? Um, when you get to the airlines, you're gonna have multiples of that. If you're flying four or five legs a day, you might have 60 checklists per day that you were reciting. And believe it or not, after all these years on the 145, I can recite that checklist purely from memory. And I find myself doing it sometimes, right? People tell you in school, in safety classes and whatnot, that you don't want to become a complacent pilot that's not looking at your checklist. I've got to tell you, it's not that easy, especially when you have thousands of hours in an airplane doing the same thing over and over and over. It's a really good habit to get in though, and I promise that you guys will not regret it if you practice using that checklist. And when you're doing a call response checklist with your instructor, physically pointing to the item that you're saying is set or checked or whatever it is to make sure it's actually set or checked. I cannot tell you how many times I've said something like transponder T-A-R-A -A, and then the captain saying set, us looking down five minutes later and realizing it's not. Those are good wake up moments, right? Realizing that you actually do need to be physically pointing and looking at those items. And it's something you can do like right now. I mean, I'm sure you saw that with students too, you know, kind of yeah. developing the rote memory stuff. Yeah, exactly. So pay attention every flight. Every flight's a chance to learn something. I'm still learning stuff now. You look back uh, when you come to CFI, see how much you didn't know when you were a private pilot. You'll become an airline pilot and look you back still and see know anything. how much you didn't know as a CFI. So you're always learning. Speaking of learning, kind of the rote knowledge versus deep knowledge stuff, right? So when you're going through your ground school classes, you're taking exams, you're doing check rides, learning all of these regulations that on paper are just regulations floating out there. The whole point about going to school here and doing what you're doing is that the knowledge you're building is going to apply literally every single day to what you guys are gonna be doing in your professional career. So let's take like class Charlie airspace for instance, right? 200 knot speed limit. When you're in the airline world, that actually matters. You will be going over 200 knots a whole lot when you're approaching airports. And it's your job to know as a pilot that your speed limit's 200. No one's gonna tell you that, and most of the time your chart's not gonna say it. You're not even gonna be on a page that shows you what airspace you're in. You're just on an IFR plate, flying around in blank space, following lines. That's all you're doing. But you have to think to yourself and realize you're in class C airspace, and you have to go slow, right? I mean, I've, exactly. I've caught myself more than a few times doing that. Happens all the time. Yeah. I guess you can kind of speak to this too, but we both, this is my good friend Corey, he was a roommate of mine here at UND. 
we wanted to talk a little bit about training habits in terms of getting to know each other right in this room and being better at not burning bridges with each other. I'm shocked at how many people I know at UND that have become captains that I've flown with, that have become chief pilots at airlines, not just my own but others, and at how many of my instructors are now flying for major airlines literally all over the world. You will end up finding people everywhere, and I promise in these pictures you can see just around the airport at O'Hare how many people we've found. So, you've seen quite a few. Have you flown with anybody from UND yet? Um, no, I haven't flown with anybody, but you see people all over every airport um, on overnight stuff. You'll you need a great connection. Um, it's you know you're in a great spot. Yeah, I've, I've definitely at least for myself, I've flown with a few captains who are actual CFIs of mine, which is kind of interesting. Speaking of CRM and authority figures, this is a really really important topic, and um, it's something you're going to experience when you're a brand new professional pilot, even if it's not in the airlines. You're going to show up on day one at your airline with 55 hours off IOE and a brand new jet, and you're going to step into the cockpit with somebody who has been flying that airplane since 1996. I'm not kidding. Who will have 16,000 hours in the airplane, and you have nothing. That's happened to all of us. It's happened to you. It's happened to me. And the important thing is recognizing the fact that you are there for a reason. You're there for a reason as a crew member to speak up when you're seeing something that you might not be happy with. And I think Cole has a really good story, at least one example of this. I have a good story, it's, you know. Um, so I would say I was about a month off of IOE. This was the beginning of last year, 2020, um, before COVID. Um, I was a, you know, bright, bushy-tailed new pilot. I saw this trip in open time that was at the tail end of a trip. It was a Houston turn. Dallas Fort Worth to Houston Intercontinental. I said, great, I want that trip. It was with a captain um, that I had previously flown with that was nice. Picked it up, not knowing it was a double line check, line check there, line check back. So, so captains have to do line checks, just like you, we have to have currency, right? Captains at the airline have special line checks they have to do every year to stay current as a captain. It's a federal, you have like a federal FAA designee writing in your jumpsuit survey. Basically like a, you know, check right here. It's nothing to, Around, yeah, it's just a normal flight. They're not asking you questions. They just want to make sure you don't screw up. Yeah, so just like the uh, flight practical portion. So anyways, I was on that flight, flew with the captain there um, that I had previously flown with. It was great. Coming back, happened to fly with our um, uh, head of our safety department and envoy. So, you know, obviously a big figure. Um, I felt kind of like a little mouse in there. Um, we we're coming back to Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, Regional approach there, vectored us in, kind of a short approach, nothing we couldn't handle, but um, got messed up with the VNAV a little bit, and we were high, we were fast, and we were not prepared. We had not done our uh, landing checklist, all that. We're at 500, so with Envoy, 500 feet, kind of like at UND, you have to be V approach plus five minus zero. We were V approach plus 27. Here I am sitting in the right seat with maybe with the director of safety for the whole airline flying, right? Yes, but on a line check, so it's a um, big deal for him. I have about 100 hours in the plane. He has, you know, 10,000, we'll just say that. Um, I called go around. I felt like, oh my gosh, um, I just, you know, ruined it for him, whatever. We uh, did our go around profile, got revectored, came around, landed, uh, taxi into the gate, and the uh, Line check airman who was uh, the designee for the FAA said, great job, uh, you made the right decision. Had you not called that, this captain or the safety um, head of our safety department would not have uh, passed that line check because obviously that was out of our standards and our SOPs. So, um, and that's why there's two people, right? You have to learn that you can be able to speak up in those situations. And our director of safety, I know him personally, great guy, super safe pilot. This stuff happens to everybody. It does, now, even when you least person. expect it. He was, you know, probably looking at our altitude and all that, completely forgot about the airspeed. And, you know, that's why it's in our checklist. That's why I would say view approach, you know, plus two, sink in 600 feet, we're good to land. So that's why it's in our checklist. Super important. There are a few things that you guys have witnessed in the past year, right? COVID industry downturns, there's a lot of things that you guys don't get choices with. Reaching 1,000 or 1,500 hours, your bad flight schedules, both with a 6 a.m. launch or a horrible four-day trip at the airline, being junior on reserve, all sorts of early calls that you're gonna get. 
All of those things are not a choice, right? But your attitude choice when you show up and you choose to enjoy your experience at UND and you choose to enjoy the fact that you're flying a regional jet, not thinking about the 24-year-old or 23-year-old that by 1% chance got to Delta at 23 years old. Keep in mind that's literally 1% of the pilot group. It is not typical. That should be a goal, but it doesn't need to overwhelm you. Um, you need to be able to enjoy where you are. You need to be able to enjoy the airline you're flying for currently or the school that you're at or this career is always just gonna be waiting for the next step, waiting for the next step, right? And it takes decades. And do you wanna be unhappy for decades? You shouldn't, yeah. So we'll talk a little bit about Envoy. Um, Cole, when were you hired? I forgot. I was hired October of 2019, so just hit my uh, second year anniversary. Okay, and I was August of 18, so just over three years now. We'll do just a little bit of a brief overview about Envoy before we dig into some specific stuff we wanted to talk about. Top-down movement. I think that this is something that uh, we were talking about earlier, if you want to explain it. So top-down movement, um, if you know anything about Envoy, you know that we're partnered with the largest airline in the world, American Airlines. Um, Envoy is a wholly owned carrier, along with there's two other sister uh, companies that we have. Um, the good thing about that being wholly owned is we have the um, flow to American Airlines whenever your seniority number comes up. So what that means is that when you uh, become the number one person on the list, you go over to American Airlines. There's not another interview, not another um, check ride or sim or anything like that. You go straight over there. And what that means is that most of our company uh, people leave from the top of the list. So there's always movement up, not to say, um, you know, you get three years in here and you're in the middle of the list, but there's people leaving below you. So you're essentially not moving. That's what happens with other carriers, but. Yeah, it's, something, it's definitely noticeable and it's gonna become more noticeable, right? As the flow is increasing, as more captains are becoming qualified to be hired by other airlines, um, the top-down movement, at least prior to COVID, which I'll take as an indicator of what's gonna happen moving forward, at least at the airline that I've been, um, you know, flying out at Envoy, was really good um, because we always had people leaving from the top of the list. There were always, there's always a need for captains to replace them. And with that, the growing 170 and 175 fleet, which you can speak to, because I haven't had the chance to fly it. Yeah, so actually it was the first flight after um, the functional check flight. I got to fly the 170 from uh, Abilene to DFW. So it's the same plane, same type rating, nothing really different about it, but um, it's exciting to see new planes coming in and getting to fly to different destinations. So yeah, and a lot of the, the routes that they're doing on this airplane are not even published on that map right now. This is a little bit old, but they got EOW ex extended over water, is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Capability for some of our airplanes. So they're doing flights way, way down south into the Caribbean, Guadeloupe, Martinique, like four hour flights one way on the 175 out of, uh, out of Miami, flying to an island just off Columbia. They're about to do some really cool stuff down there, so. Yeah, so we stay about, I think it's 162, 163 miles um, from the coast, so it actually opens up quite a bit for us. In terms of the flow, right, you guys have probably heard about the flow to American. It's a thing in every wholly owned um, Piedmont, PSA, and Envoy. The flow is a really great plan A, and it's also a really great plan B. Um, there's a lot of people that I fly with at, uh, at my company who rely on the flow to have career progression that really want to be at American Airlines, and maybe that's their best way to get there. Um, it also can be a really great plan B. You're going to build the same experience flying a regional jet that you would at any other company, and then you can apply to any airline with that same experience that you might find at other airlines, right? So it doesn't preclude you from going to a big cargo carrier or another major airline to fly it somewhere like Envoy that's so tied up to American. But you also have it in your back pocket that you know you have career progression. And that was probably the biggest factor about why I chose to go there. I'd say yeah, it was one of my top three reasons too. So. Reserve and line holding is kind of the next thing we wanted to touch on real quick. And I know that Cole, I think it's on the next slide, it has a lot to say about this. Because due to COVID, Cole was on reserve for two years. Yes. I can tell you anything you want to know about reserve. So after we're done here, if you want to know anything, come up to me. What he's trying to say is when he looks out here, he's seeing seniority numbers, and it's really exciting. <laughs> um, so reserve at Envoy, which we were going to talk about, looks kind of like this. This was an example of what I experienced at Envoy um, back in July when I forgot to bid, which probably some of you know. Um, my reserve schedule is on the left. This is how the month started. I left the days blank, showing which days 
um, work days off. And then you can see on the right what the schedule turned into throughout the month on reserve with different trips that I was assigned, some of which I proffered for or picked up because I actually wanted to fly them. And then towards the very end of the month, we started getting more first officers on the list, hopefully some of you guys, um, that started filling in the bottom of the list. So I was able to avoid getting called, which means I was getting paid to sit at home. On the 18th, 24th, and 26th, you can see that reserve availability period, REP, um, I was never called to do anything. So I just got to sit at home and be paid a little bit of extra, um, you know, or a full day actually really to do that, which was pretty cool. Now on the next slide, I'll get to show you, this looks really clean and organized actually for a reserve schedule. Which I agree, schedule. it looks very pretty. Like pretty, yeah. pretty clean and organized. Well, this is Cole's schedule just a few months ago. <laughs> Can anybody read this? I can't read this. So, okay, so usually red doesn't mean good, but all the red is, um, rest legalities per that VA. So every 168 hours, you have to have a 30 hour rest, uh, crew schedule is not contacting you, you're away from work, all that, yada, yada, yada. So all the red is my uh, legality rest. The blue, as Swain had just said, is the wrap, so I'm on a two hour call out. Uh, you said the red, the 30, that stands for 30 hours, right? You can see it go 24 just into the next day. So your rest for every seven, every six days or seven days in a row, seven you have to have a 30 hour rest period. So that's why you can see those spaced out. Yeah, so you see I have a lot of those compared to what Swain had. Um, I had two days like he uh, did my last two days of uh, two reserve assignments where I didn't get called. Um, you can see the two trips at the beginning of the month. I had proper for those because they were with a captain that I had previously flown with. That was awesome. Had a great time going to those overnights. Um, what else? The 13th and 14th side airport standby. Can tell you, you don't want to do that. Did that many days last year. So basically, you go to the airport, you sit there, and you watch all your friends leave, depart, all that, and you sit there not getting the flight. They need you for yeah. So it's like if, um, you know, misconnect someone, misconnects. Say there's a. Um, weather and you know you're available there's a plane available they're gonna get get another flight out on time versus delaying so kind of like that um, and I know this looks a little overwhelming but really earlier when we were talking about how your life is going to be determined by a calendar not only is this a complicated calendar but this is a calendar that he did not know would exist at the beginning of the month because he was on reserve right so this schedule was basically blank at the beginning of the month and it just got filled in to make things really, you know, just so you know, like it, it can be kind of overwhelming how much gets filled in. And then one last thing I'll point out is you see the 26, 27, 28, which happens to be this week, it says RC stands for recruiting, so I was lucky enough to, to come talk to you wonderful people instead of sitting airport standby. So I am thrilled to be here. <laughs> he was really looking forward to that break, I think, at the bottom. So I want to talk a little bit about this. This is something unique to our contracted envoy. I just figured I would bring it up because I'm about to experience it next month. Um, it's called DTS, which is a part of our contract. I don't know if other airlines have it. I'm, they might, but I haven't heard of any, at least to my knowledge. DTS means drop um, trip sequence. Or, yeah. And so basically what it means is a contractual piece of my vacation week, which you can see was from the 6th to the 12th of November next month. Originally, the line that I bid for had a schedule of a four-day trip from the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th, that was a trip, and then the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th was also a four-day trip. But with DTS enabled, if my vacation touches the trip, 18 days off in a row. And I can cover it with sick time, so I'm not losing any pay. Plus, because I got my captain award for December, I'm also being paid as a captain. So I'm getting basically 18 days off, not losing pay, and getting captain pay for it. So it's so, great. Yes, so it's great. So to counter that previous point, this you know there are pros and cons to the airline schedules too, um, and we'll talk a little bit about you know flight benefits and stuff too, which is exactly what I'll be doing um, next Friday. So actually, yeah, there it is. So flight privileges, right? I know this is kind of crazy, and some of you might have experienced flight privileges uh, through family. I've had flight privileges for three or four years now, and this is a map of all the places that I've been um, for free with the airlines, right? Purely for free, not for work at all. 
Awesome. If you can find the time and you're a cadet and you get a few weeks off, use them. This is the time in your life when you will get the opportunity to go to some really, really cool places and bring friends with you. I know that you've enjoyed it too, right? You have a trip to uh, yeah. Hawaii or something? Uh, I have a trip to Cancun the first week of December and then second week of January going to Hawaii. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, and then I'm going to um, Brazil in a week, so on Friday for for quite a little bit of time. So the benefits of the airline, this is kind of like the drug that every, every airline kind of hooks people on. They're like, oh, we're gonna give you fried privileges and you are never going to leave. <laughs> the three cues, um, we were talking about this, Cole hadn't heard about this earlier, but I did wanna mention this. Quality of life, quality of job, and quality of pay. This kind of brings us into the last segment of what we wanted to talk to you guys about. These pull on each other. Imagine a triangle and you think of quality of job, maybe you want to be the youngest 777 captain at United. Great. There are some things that are going to suffer, though, because of that. You're going to be on reserve probably for a decade because that's a senior airplane, and you're going to be on reserve, which means you're going to have less time away. I'm assuming you're going to have less time at home, spending more time away. So your quality of job increased. You got something you're really excited about, but your pay might suffer even though you're on a bigger airplane because you're breaking guarantee on reserve with less days off during the month. And that goes for anything. If you want to be home all the time and you want to be a senior reserve pilot who almost never gets called, your pay is going to shrink probably, but your life is going to be a lot better and your job might suffer because you're not building flight experience to be qualified to move on and up, right? So they're all pulling on each other all the time. Um, which Cole is going to talk about a little bit. These are some of the factors that are like out there in the world for airline pilots to figure out that are pulling on them. Um, so the big one that comes to me is living in base. Um, so I'm based in DFW, live in Fort Worth. Made it really easy to be sitting in airport standby every day uh, for the past year. Had I lived in Grand Fork, stayed here, or lived at my parents in uh, Florida, I would probably have to have gotten another place and commuting back and forth probably wouldn't be ideal. So that's a big one for me is living in base. Um, another one I say is uh, reserve rules. So that's a big one too. If you're gonna be on reserve for a while, you want a good um, contract so that you're, you know, not, I don't wanna say suffering, but you know, you have a better uh, quality of life, for example. And eventually family needs, right? Becomes a big part of that equation. Um, for some of the people that you might think, you know, have the opportunity to fly on a wide-body airplane or they would love to fly the 787, maybe they need to be bidding domestically, flying as many day trips as they can on the 737 because they have kids at home that they need to help with at their family, right? So you need to imagine the airline job, right? It's like this great thing we all want to do, but you have to find a way of meshing it in there with the rest of your life and finding the balance that works well. And it, it takes a long time to figure that out, to figure out what the balance that works for you is. I can tell you from experience uh, from other UND grads that were you know, three to 15 years, 20 years um, senior to me, uh, asked them, oh, you know, what should I do? Should I go work for airline A or airline B? Should I live in city A or city B? And they said, you know, one would say this, one would say that. It's all personal opinion, so it's what matters to you most. Your track is what you want to do, not what your parents, your mentors, your friends, whatever. You got to decide for yourself. Yeah, and these are things, as, he, as Cole said, that you'll see the most senior captains and airlines. They're grappling with this stuff too, just like we are year one, day one at an airline. Um, it, it applies to everybody the same, just by nature, the way the career works. So I wanted to give you guys another example, sort of, of that quality of life, quality of job assessment, just to give you guys an example, really in depth, of what an airline schedule might look like. So at the top, the block number, we've been at lines at Envoy, it's a little bit of a different system than some of the other airlines that are PBS based where you're selecting days and types of trip pairings that you want. We bid for pure lines, which actually makes this a little bit simple to explain. So on the left, you can see block number 46 has 15 days off, a credit of 72 hours, or 72.03, the minimum is 72, so that's breaking even, blocking 72 hours, that's 72 hours of flight time, with time away from base being 286 hours during the month. That's 286 hours you will be on the road, more if you're commuting. On the right, block number 63 has 11 days off, crediting at 91 hours, that's 21% more pay than the other, the other line, blocking 91 hours also, 
um, which means that you're going to be building more flight experience. Maybe you want to have more hours so that you can qualify the captain faster or be able to move on to another carrier. But you're going to have 10 days off. And the reason it's 10 days off is because this schedule, as you can see on the bottom, goes from the 28th, 29th, 30th into the next month, into July. Subtracts, think of it as subtracting a day off from your life, right? Because now the next month, if you had the July 1st as an off day in your bid, you're working because your trip from this month is now into the next month. Really interesting the way that that works. And again, this comes down to balancing, right? Trying to figure out how you want your pay, how you want your flight time that you're building um, to be kind of based. I'll leave it to Cole for this. This is another beautifully complicated schedule. I, I don't know how he's managed to paint rainbows on the schedule. But. So as you can see, this was September 2020. Um, I don't know if many of you are aware, but last October was a uh, very dark time for a lot of people in the airline industry, but anyways, you know, we've uh, survived it. So September 2020, you can see from the beautiful orange up there that I had eight days of vacation. And as Swain had previously mentioned with our DTS, I had two trips that got dropped. But if you look up on here, you'll see I have trips on there. So on what top happened, of the vacation, right? What happened was um, I had gotten my warn letter, so I knew I was going to be furloughed on Absolutely. October 1st. Well, Yes, you were, I was you warned yes. that I was going to be. Um, so, um, with Envoy, we're allowed to pick up extra trips on our, top of our vacation. So, uh, the two trip, two four-day trips I had, so that's eight days of pay, probably about um, 40 hours of pay, um, got paid for that, and then I picked up, I don't know, a few, what is that? That's at 150% too, so yeah, it's 60 so, hours of pay. Yes, so I picked up that while I said, well, it's the sun's shining, I'm gonna make some hay. Well, it is shining. So that's just exactly what I did. Um, on the 17th of September, you'll see that says YYC, that stands for Calgary, uh, Canada, and Alberta. Beautiful picture, it was my first time there. Uh, so excited. Uh, the next day was the 18th, and you'll see that says AGU, AGU, which stands for Aguas Calientes, Mexico. So I went from Calgary, Dallas, Fort Worth, Aguas Calientes. So two international uh, destinations, back to back, doesn't happen very often, but since it's OT, um, that's what happened. So I had a beautiful time out there. You'll see that's one of the nice historic cathedrals um, in Mexico. And then the picture to the right, she, that's Dawn, one of my favorite flight attendants. Every time I see her name, I always pick up those trips. So um, going off on a tangent, but you'll uh, see crew members' names and you'll uh, you know avoid some. You'll pick up some because it's your favorite person. But um, yeah, so it's something. It's really amazing important. what happens when you get stuck inside a four-foot metal tube for four days with someone you've never met. It's crazy some of the conversations that come up. It's either you're really great friends or you're really not. <laughs> Um, in this example of my schedule, again, I don't know how Cole's managed to, <laughs> to make his so complicated. Mine was a little bit more clean. This was actually the first time I had ever gotten my first choice of a line schedule, which was super exciting. And the reason that it was the first time was because this was actually a pretty crappy line. Um, I had 10 days off because I had three days of carryover. It was 13 day offline, but with three days of carryover, kind of like having 10 days off. I also only flew about 45 hours during the whole month with multiple lost days in Cincinnati, Greensboro, and Greensboro again. But I got to do a lot of flying down in Miami that I was really, really excited about um, because I had the opportunity to go fly back and forth and do day trips out of Miami to the Bahamas. I think there's like six Miami overnights up there. Those at the bottom, you can see those are the overnights for the trip. Um, so we stayed in Miami quite a lot overnight, which was awesome. And the captain that I flew with, um, that I kind of talked about in the video, Lisa was absolutely one of my favorite captains. She's now at United Airlines. Um, and we had just a blast during the month. We even rented our own Airbnb on South Beach because we weren't happy with our crew hotel just one night because we really wanted to go out and you know have some fun. So, you know, there's good opportunities with this stuff. And we've been really happy with you know our career so far. And it's really exciting to see you guys coming into the industry at a really great time now that COVID's over and we've seen how big the rebound has happened. So with that, I want to open things up to questions and thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Let's see. Yeah, if anybody needs to go, like feel free. It's not awkward. You can leave if you need to leave. Um, otherwise, you can stick around to ask questions if you guys have any.
Just feel free to stick your hand up and shout it out. Go for it. What kind of flight benefits did Mocha Lele have? Just play your mouse on real quick, sorry, it's hard to... Yeah, what kind of flight benefits did Mocha Lele have? Mocha Lele had really great uh, flight benefits, actually. Um, we had cast privileges on almost every major airline, so we got the jump seat, and we also had said fare agreements with most major airlines around the world. So I got to buy Z fares, basically almost free tickets on uh, airlines like Emirates. I also flew in the jump seat on Atlas on 747s all around the world um, to be able to help people out, or excuse me, to be able to go uh, explore, do some vacations and stuff like that. So yeah, it was great. So with your vacation coming up, are we seeing more videos? Yeah, actually, so I was showing this to Cole um, with the vacation. He asked if there's going to be more videos coming. Uh, last week, I did something that I never expected I would do, and I went to be an undercover ramper for a day. So I got to go throw some bags, I got to marshal some planes, and got to do some cool stuff out on the ramp um, that I've never done at the airline. And so there's kind of a funny video about that coming. Yeah, we'll like that, so be on the lookout. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. I have some questions. Um, yep. So, how was the Mokulele Airlines? Do you like it? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, it was flying Mokulele was awesome. I mean, I if I could do that job forever and fly international wide body and live in Hawaii, it'd be great. But it's not gonna happen. So. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a part of one thirty five uh, uh, operation. Thirty five. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is there any way you can be like a qualify uh, and the, to be current as a part one thirty five after you complete the uh, three twenty five? Have a, like a wet commercial instrument rating and... Uh, you can, yeah, and I actually, that's when I was hired there. So um, I, I was hired at Mokulele with a commercial certificate and an in instrument rating. I also have my multi because that's a part of the, that's kind of irrelevant because it's a caravan, but I did have my multi. At the time for flying 135, and that's the case today, Southern Airways, Boutique Air, um, I'm trying to think, Cape Air, a few, a few of the other ones, commercial, multi, instrument, that's all you need. You don't need a lot of time. Most Part 135 carriers, the sweet spot is right around 500 hours of flight time to start being eligible to be considered. Southern Airways Express owns Mokulele now, so that's the carrier that people would go to to try to, to go out to the Hawaii office. And also, uh, so if I'm able to fly like uh, the turbine, like that, to build an hour, to build my uh, 1,000 hour, all 1250, mm -hmm. uh, is that looks better on my resume and uh, is that, uh, do I have like a better seniority when I get to hired by the airline, by original? Um, you won't have any better seniority, but he, uh, what he was asking is if you go to a 135 track, like I did, does the turbine time from a caravan or something like that help you with your airline career versus being a CFI UND? And I would say no, it's just different. I've never seen an airline preference Mokulele or caravan turbine time, which is just basically turboprop time over being a CFI. Schools love their CFIs, the cadet programs, especially if you can get, a, get to be a part of a really solid program that's supported by a major airline, is far more valuable than worrying about getting some turbine time. But the only exception I would say to that is that there are some airlines, um, United is an example, where they require you to have, let's say, 2,000 total turbine time. And for me, because my time was built flying turbine, I meet that threshold sooner than some of my friends who are flying pistons. Even if they have more flight time than I do, I have more turbine time than they do. So, you know. Got it. Yeah. Also, is it hard to like a transition from uh, the Archer left seat to a uh, like part 175 right seat? No. Are you yeah. comfortable with that? Yep. After coming through UND, yeah, I was very the check rides, the training you guys are getting at UND is way harder, honestly, than even airline training. And I'm, I, I think you'd agree, I agree, right? I completely agree. Yeah. Um, I, just so you guys can relax a little, like, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Raise your hand if you've been in 480. 480, what's that? Oh, Sierra Sierra oh yeah, you guys, yes. what year are you guys, mainly freshmen, sophomores? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, so after you get through 480, that's probably the hardest course that I took here, I would say, besides the CFI check yeah, right? CFI, but, CFI, super hard, yes. like the brain to mouth thing, learning how to fly an airplane physically, like monkey see, monkey do, very easy. Speaking about it to somebody to teach them, that's hard. And that's why CFI is hard. But, but yes, I'll yeah. say 480 um, was harder than our uh, ATP check right at Envoy. So y'all yep. don't need to yep. worry. UND prepares you excellent. Most airlines, and this is something that I, you know, just like keep in the back of your mind. By the time you guys get to the airlines, almost every airline will be on an, it's called AQP. It's a training curriculum, and that's what Envoy uses, and almost every regional airline uses. 
it's a very specific standards for what they can ask you during a check ride. So my checking event, you know basically what's going to be asked of you. You know exactly what you're going to be doing during your maneuvers validation, and sometimes even during your LOE sort of line um, experience flight that they're like judging you on. It's very, very regimented. It's not like you're sitting down, being a CFI, sitting in front of your check ride examiner, and them basically telling you to teach them how to fly, right? Way easier than that. So, yeah. Okay, I have one last question. So if you are in like a part 135 or part 121 airlines, um, so as you mentioned uh, before, uh, if there are no passenger, no cargo operations, you can log in like a PIC as across the country time in that flight? Um, you can log in. Well, anything is cross country time. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, honestly, when you get to that point, it probably is irrelevant. There's very, very few flights we fly empty. And yeah, I don't, I'm not really sure. So, okay. yeah, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else? Yes. It makes more sense for you, but why didn't you decide to do one of like the CAD programs here? Yeah, that's a really good question, actually. So, for me, I really wanted to have the experience of doing something just a little bit more adventurous. Like, to be quite honest, I never thought I was going to be an airline pilot. Even through about sophomore year at UND, I wanted to go like fly a bush. I wanted to go to Alaska. I wanted to go to Africa and do stuff like that. That said, the industry was moving in such a way that I knew that if I could get in early enough, that it would be really, really good. So I tried to find a way of balancing the two, where I would be building experience by doing something that was a little bit more adventurous than just um, you know sticking around and instructing, which is also a great way to do it. I just wanted to have something in between school and starting at the regional airlines, at which point you will never leave the airlines, <laughs> for the most part, that would be kind of like that. So yeah. is, that, is that kind of what you're thinking? Or? Yeah. No, yeah. Yep. Why did you decide to say it would be for about six months, then the post six months? OK, so yeah. Um, I'll be honest with y'all, when I was a freshman, I wanted to do aviation management. I did not want to become a CFI. I took the first accounting class, lasted a week, and I said, nope, this is not for me. So I'll right back to commercial aviation. So I knew I had to do CFI. Um, while I was here, I was a part of, I believe, six or seven different regional airline um, cadet programs or whatever you would Wouldn't really recommend that, by the way, but well, yeah. you know. So um, that's kind of how I got started in it. Um, I was instructor here for six months. Um, being that I was in the Envoy Cadet Program, they have schools all across the um, country. So say you live in, uh, I don't know, where's the school we have? Say you're from George, uh, Alabama and you want to go instruct at Auburn. Auburn. Yeah. Um, that's something you can do. So, um, you know, I said I was from Texas. I wanted to get back to Texas. Um, like, I'm sure most of you can't wait to get out of here and <laughs> go get out of the cold. That was me. Yeah. So, um, I, I showed up when I showed up today, by the way. I hope this makes you all feel good. I showed up today trying to film some stuff at the airport for a video of coming out, and I was weathered. Yeah, so that's, that was really yes. fun. Yes. Yeah. Um, I never thought that would happen again. I like woke up, it was like a little bit of PTSD. I'm like sitting there, showering, getting ready, and I checked my phone, and I still had on my favorite section, the UND flight restrictions tab. I clicked on it, and I'm like, damn. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to leave, um, you know, go experience something else. So I um, asked them, hey, do you have any schools in Texas? They said, yep, we've got, you know, A, B, and C. Um, looked at A, flight school A, they hired me, and I said, great, I'm leaving. I left the, well, two weeks later. Went and started there, I can tell you, I don't think it was a mistake, but it was a rude awakening. The planes, the newest one they had, I believe was like 1980. Um, no glass cockpits, um, all new procedures. Um, students from yeah, countries students I had not even heard of. So it was a, yes, definitely rude awakening, but um, I know UND prepared me well. So um, again, and I, I'm grateful for that. Um, I know some of us can kind of get complacent, stuck in the UND bubble. Um, while I was there, you know, being a CFWI, um, we were flying the stars and sits throughout the DFW Metroplex, something that you don't really get at UND unless you go to the cities. But um, so it's kind of I wanted to move back home and um, plus get a new experience. So, yeah. Anybody else over here? Not at all. Yeah. No, like I said, I was involved with six different carriers, so it was, you know. <laughs> so what I would say, things are changing a little bit. 
Um, when I came in as a freshman, there was this hodgepodge of aviation cadet programs with all sorts of different airlines. Each one had one and it was all very complicated. That said, the airlines are moving in a direction because of such a pilot need where they're starting dedicated programs that it might become harder and harder to get hired at your dream carrier if you're not going to go down their track that they really want people to go down. So like Aviated United is probably a good example of that. They're really trying to bring people inside that program. Um, and they want that to be the way that people will get to United. So if United, when you come in as a dream, try to set yourself up to get inside that program and go down that track. There's nothing wrong though with not knowing where you want to go. In fact, sometimes it can be worse to try to close doors to really good opportunities that might exist elsewhere because you're from Atlanta and just love Delta. You know, like there's other things out there too, so yeah. To kind of piggyback off of that, um, you might be wondering, okay, why are these um, major airlines kind of narrowing you down, wanting you to be with the, carry the regional carriers that um, they want you to, and it's pretty much all standardization when you agree with them. Yeah, I would, and they want you to become, you know, they want you to be a, like a team member. They want you to be in their group. They want to bring you up as their little pilot that, you know, that they're making you wholesome and well-rounded to be the perfect fit at United American or Delta, right? So. Great example of like the standardization is like our um, flight operations manual very much um, mimics uh, mainline Americans. So it's kind of, you know, standardization. Yeah, all of our call-outs and Envoy, all of our checklists, all of our flows, all of our procedures, standardization, like it is exactly what American, even our printout, like our takeoff data that comes out of the printer in the airplane looks the same as when I'm doing seating on an American flight. Um, it's very similar. So when they keep you in the system, right, like it, it makes it easier to train you. Exactly, yeah. So when you go there, you're already familiar with all their procedures and all that. Anybody else? Biggest challenge to overcome. Do you have one that comes to mind right away? I would say for me, um, this, as I was saying, like the CFI of uh, reciting knowledge that I had in my head just naturally of, like, you know how to fly a steep turn, but suddenly there's an instructor next to you that's pretending to know nothing. And you have to tell them, like, no, you need to add rudder here and add aileron correction here and add a little power. Like, you have to know how to do that. And it takes practice. I would say that was probably one of the harder things. Other than that, systems, I don't know if anybody else hates systems, but I'm really bad with systems. Raise your hand if you hate systems. Yeah, like mechanics, systems, I'm just, it's not my thing. Um, fortunately at the airlines, a lot of systems, it's, it's more based around what button is in the cockpit and how will this impact what the system is versus like, can you build the airplane? Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, so I guess my hardest thing to overcome other than CFI was probably like time management. Um, moving up here, getting used to the way, you know, all that kind of stuff, but um, you all are still here, so you're probably doing just fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? Why did you get into film? Say again. Why did you get, uh, why did you get into film? Like, yeah, um, so the, yeah, that's why I get into film, uh, doing some of the film work. Well, for me, like, how, are any of you guys the only person in your family who flies? Anybody? Wow. That's actually a lot, yeah. So that was my thing too, right? Like I had nobody in my family who was in aviation and I wanted to help people find a way to get into the industry better because when I wanted to become a pilot, I started going through forums and stuff like that when I was 15, which was a horrible idea because it was just really, really nasty. And going through all of that, I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a resource. I didn't have anything that would show me about the career I wanted to do. So I tried to set myself up in a way that I'd be able to go build a portfolio of experience flying from Okalele and filming there under 135, which also had never been done before, working with the FAA to do that, to then bring it to the actual Part 121 airline world and be like, hey, we've done this, we've done this safely, I know how to work with the FAA to get this approved, um, and that's kind of why. So, yeah. Anybody else? And we'll take like three more after this. Yeah. Um, so No, no, 
know, yeah, none of that stuff will be. And in fact, um, like for instance, yesterday, I'll be very honest, like when I was filming a flight yesterday, it was a Czech flight on the Embraer 175 for their first ever time going into a Luther in the Bahamas, which is a tiny, tiny runway, no markings, 6,000 feet long, basically a gravel strip in the middle of nowhere. It's honestly shocking we fly there in an airline. Like UND would not have it in their book. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not kidding. And so, to answer your question, I was filming it to do some 360 um, degree footage stuff. And there's little oopsies here and there, right? Like there's checklists that people might have missed, a, missed an item on. It happens on every flight, like nobody flies perfectly. So it won't be, it won't come back to heart, hurt them in any way. And in fact, I you know, can cleverly edit out some of those mistakes too, of course. So if you ever watching those videos and the screen goes black for a second and comes back, like now you know, right? <laughs> Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, did you attend UND while, while also flying for Mokulele? I did. So this one, I get asked this a lot. Um, did I come to school while I was also flying at Mokulele? So I had um, two friends of mine that were sort of mentors uh, to me that I grew up flying with, um, who went to Mokulele as street captains in February of 2017. And when I saw what they were doing, I was like, man, I really want to do this job. And at the time, because Mokulele was owned by its own management team, it was like a hometown family airline. Um, I went, I actually bought a ticket um, to go sit face to face with their chief pilot. So I flew out there in spring break and I was like, hey, I'm qualified for this job. I would love to do this, but I only have four months full time, May through August before I have to go back to school. And I was like, I told him, I was like, I know you have some part time captains who are flying for the airline, who are retired captains. We had retired captains flying the caravan who were the 787 chief test pilot. Like crazy, crazy experience who came to Hawaii and that was their retirement job. So I started my career by retiring. But anyway, <laughs> I, um, I went out there and convinced them that they would let me do part time after that. So I don't think that that exists right now, to be quite honest. I wish I could tell you otherwise um, because they're owned by Southern Airways Express, which is a much bigger part 135 carrier. If you have the experience and there's a company locally, Fargo, for instance, that you can build your schedule around so that you have four days you're eligible to fly charter or something like that, could be an option. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, so you said you wanted something more adventurous, like in the airlines, is there that sense of like change every day or is it kind of get repetitive? That's a really good question. Um, do you want to answer this one? So, yeah, so uh, a sense of change. Um, you might be based in Chicago, Miami, Dallas, Fort Worth, but you're always going to new places. It's not like, okay, we're going to um, Mayville every Champagne time. We're going to the time. time. Every time, you know, you're not going to the same practice areas or um, same airports, you know, you're mixing up. Like this past month, I was doing DCA, uh, Washington, Reagan, Phoenix, Miami, uh, Chicago, and Dallas, Fort Worth, so I was, West Coast, East Coast, South, North. Like one of their back. days on the 175, much different than what I fly, was uh, Reno, Austin, Miami, Key Western. That's a long way all the way across the country in one day of flying. Exactly. And like you might fly in the same places, but um, you know, it mixes up so much. You're flying with different crew members, different weather, all this kind of stuff. It's like it's not. It doesn't get really. I wouldn't um, say it's too monotonous. It's probably a little bit to counter him, just a tiny bit. It's probably a little bit better on the 175 when you're at an airline on a growing fleet, especially one that flies farther to like more. Um, American is using it to fly to destinations that have less passengers, but they're far destinations. They can't fill up a 730 or an Airbus, but they can fill up a 175 and can make it there. Okay. On the 145. We do a lot more flights that are less than an hour and a half. So if you want me to like rattle off every airport in Iowa I've been to, I could just sleep and be there. You know, um, those airports, you know, it can get repetitive occasionally. Um, but like he said, the situationality of like going into an airport with different weather, different people. Every day, there's something that happens that I've never experienced. I will, I will genuinely say that. Yeah. There, every single day at the airline. Um, 1,400 hours of flight time at the airline later, I have every single day had something weird happen. So, normally not dangerous, but weird, so. He means yeah. learning something like, oh, here's something, you know, a cool new trick in the FMS, here's a right. cool new trick with our um, or emergency. Yeah. Have, you, have you declared emergencies? I don't know. Onboard. No, no, oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I've had, I've had like five at Onboard, but it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It happens, and that's not to speak bad on camera about Envoy. That's about any airline, that's what I think, so, yeah. Um, so
training within the United States for airlines, such as here at UND, um, they're mostly catered to domestic centers. So if you're looking at like Lufthansa or SAS across seas, the centers there, how would you recommend a smooth transition using alliance programs such as United Star Alliance with international airlines? In terms of like going to work there one day? Exactly. Yeah, so it's um, that's a good question. There, there are ways of converting your licenses, like in EASA, um, over in Europe. Their ACPL exams are extremely intense. You guys are very lucky to be becoming airline pilots in the U.S. because their exams, they have 12 or 11 ACPL exams that they have to take to become a airline transport pilot in Europe, and they're very hard. Like they have basically 11 versions of our ATP written, broken down by specific categories and they're very in-depth. Um, so transitioning your licenses is something you would have to do. You have to have, I don't know if you're a citizen over there. Yeah, so you'd be able to have work authorization to be there, but you would have to have all your experience and then convert your license and see kind of what options there are that way. Um, there's a chance, I, I don't know, I haven't heard of a lot of people doing it, um, but there is a chance, you know, if you were a part of the United program, somehow there's a connection to like Lufthansa, um, that that could somehow work out, but honestly, it doesn't happen enough for me to really know, so. Yeah, sorry, I, yeah, I wish I had a more concise answer. We do two more questions, if that works. Yeah, yes? Do all airlines love the Say again. Do all airlines love the flight deck? No, yeah, actually, this is, um, yeah, so, except for very limited exceptions. Uh, what I've been able to get approval for is the only time and currently is the only approval in the US for any Part 121 cockpit footage or at an airline. Um, there's, it just isn't done very much. Um, there's a lot of liability at stake uh, for the airlines and it has to be done in a way like I have to have my footage reviewed every single time before I post it online. Like there is a safety structure I go through to have footage go out, you know. Because it's not only that, but there can be security concerns, right? Like post 9-11 world, do you really want to show a full engine start flow to somebody? Probably not, you know? So, yeah, that's like real, that's real stuff they think about at the airlines. Yeah. All right, one more. Yeah. Do you use one? I use Log10 Pro. I do as well. While I was at UNI, I used Sportflight just because that's what my um, instructor used. But once I went to the airline, I used Log10. Yep, log time, that's what I've used as well. It, it syncs really well for airline apps, for instance, which is, you know, an application software. There's preset forms for your FAA 8710 for airline apps, things like that, that generates all of your flight time. Um, if you're not keeping an electronic logbook, start, like seriously start. You can keep your paper logbook all you want, which I actually don't anymore. Do you? Uh, no, once yeah, I got to the airline, I quit. The yeah, book. I stopped when I got to Mobile Lele, so I was actually, I don't know, I, I haven't had a paper logbook in like five years, but, um, Keep a track on paper for now if you're doing that at UND because you probably still have to. And then also have the electronic that you're building on the side. Wouldn't recommend doing it on your own spreadsheet. A lot of people do that. Um, there's a lot of errors that can happen there and there's not great ways of sorting out the flight time. Some of the dedicated programs like Log10, you can build a smart group. Let's say an airline, like when I apply to American Airlines, if I'm filling out an application and they want to know how much PIC cross country time I have in a Piper Archer. I can make a smart group exactly for that, and boom, there it is. I don't have to dig through my logbook and total, you know, tally it up, which I can't imagine how long that would take. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. We're going to hang out here, so if anybody wants to come up and ask questions, we'll be here. But have a great evening. Thanks for having us, y'all. Appreciate thank you. it.